could you just walk through, let's say, like an, an average day as an interpreter when you were at the hospital? I, I'll utilize, like? yeah, I'll utilize the experience at the children's hospital because um, only because I feel that the I, my best experience and where I understood what a wraparound service was for the interpreter was at the children's hospital, and I'll and I'll explain a little further. So. When I started working as a professional interpreter, everything you learn in the classroom in theory, you think that everybody knows this information wherever you're going to go work at, right? You think everyone already knows this information. This is how naive we are. You know, we're just excited to go to the schooling. Um, everyone knows how to work with a professional or a trained interpreter. So I walk into the general hospital and there was some understanding, but not complete understanding, meaning that the nurse would still say, explain this document to the patient. Um, and then she'd walk out and I, and I'd say, excuse me, you're not supposed to walk out and leave me here. I don't, you know, if, the, if they have questions, I don't know the answers to that. So we get trained that we're not supposed to be left in, in a patient's room by ourselves for that very reason, because then the patient, I mean, imagine, oh, you speak my language, right? And so mm -hmm. they get going into stuff that we don't know anything about, or we shouldn't know. Um, and so that was kind of the experience in the general hospital. This is where I, where I first realized, yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> they teach us one thing, and then the, you know, real life, it's a different thing. But then when I made my way into the children's hospital, this was an experience where I realized that they've got a wraparound service for for the service in general. And what I mean by that is that they've got a call system. Uh, just like <clears throat> because it's a large hospital, so if there's a need for anything, let's say they need a gurney, the call center will, you know, locate the service and then send out the gurney to wherever it needs to go, right? That was basically, in essence, the same thing for the interpreter, something we did not have at the general hospital. The general hospital was like we were working in the departments, and so we would just get we would get paged, there was a little pager that, you know, we'd get paged and we'd run to uh, our assignment. The Children's Hospital, we also had pagers, but it was more uniformed. Um, there were many interpreters on site. Uh, all of them had had training. Uh, the doctors, the professionals there had been trained to work with an interpreter. And one of the first things that I remember that took me aback was that I showed up to the hospital and, um, or the room, the patient's room, and the doctor and the nurse were standing out there waiting for me to arrive, and they were briefing me. And I thought, oh no, they think I'm someone else, right? And I remember like looking around, like they think I'm one, I'm one of the other specialists. And then they gave me the quick rundown and then said, are you ready interpreter? And I was like, so what they're doing is they're giving they're giving you context because as an interpreter okay. you need context before you walk into the room terminology what is the diagnosis and all that because you're going mm. to need that information it's super i mean we were in the ICU in the children's hospital so you could only imagine wow. something there is some serious stuff going on um that was an experience that stayed like like just imprinted in my memory because i i remember thinking this is these are professionals other professionals that look at you the interpreter the language professional as another professional share the information for context so that you know what you're walking into and then and they knew how to work with the interpreter meaning they they would say something like, you know, they, a couple of renditions or um, utterances, excuse me, and then they would pause for the interpreter. And then they would look at the patient. They would not look at the, these are all things we learn in school that providers should do, but not everyone gets that training. Not everyone understands the why. Um, so yeah, day and night, I, I would get called. It was a very fun and fulfilling job in the sense that I was challenged all the time. There were different departments in the hospital, different specialties. You know, it's, it's a pretty big hospital. And so that means that they provided neurological services. They provided um, gastrointestinal services. You know, I mean, it was all sorts of different specialties. So every call that I got, 
I knew it was going to be something completely different. There was no same department where as to the general hospital, I worked in labor and delivery. And while that was, you know, fun in the sense that there was never a dull moment running around, there's a lot of babies being born. It was the same terminology over and over. And the children's hospital was not completely different. I'd get paid, I'd go to one department, come back, sometimes get paged after I was done with that one. And, and, the person where the centralized services was happening knew where you were where you were at each time. So they knew if I if I had checked out of that assignment that I was now open to send me to a new one. So I mean it was just very well put together. Mm -hmm. What was the longest conversation that you had to interpret when you were at the hospital? At the hospital, it was an end of life. Um, so this is basically where the doctor is informing the, uh, patient, the patient's family that, um, the child is about to take their last breath. And so, you know, it, there, it's basically in preparation. So there, it was long, um, in the sense that we weren't there for a long time interpreting, but there was a lot of pauses, I'm sure you can imagine, in between uh, allowing the family to process the information and then so that they could ask the questions needed, you know, things like that. Um, other, uh, a, a, a long one in terms of actual time would be the actual presentation of diagnosis to the patient um, in which there's all the different specialty doctors that are there and they are explaining the diagnosis of the patient to the family, to the parents. It's always, it was a children's hospital, so the patient was always a child. Um, that, was, that was pretty long because of all the specialties um, that, that, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's one problem, one diagnosis, but that diagnosis is several things, right? There's several things in one. There's different specialty doctors that are there informing the parents of what is going on with the child. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that pretty intense. Like <laughs> Children's Hospital was pretty intense. It was it was no joke and and you know, I think that if I had had the opportunity to be there um full time as a full time employee, I would have stayed there just because it's I mean like I said, there's just there's such a high need and um it was challenging all the time. So it wasn't boring at all. To say the least. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. And I think I've heard before that there's different types of interpreting as far as I can't, I can't remember the words right now. Yeah, yeah, there is. <laughs> like called, a delayed kind of response, you know what I mean? Uh -huh, yeah, they're, so they're called modes of interpreting and community modes. interpreting, which is in essence, it's like this big umbrella term for a lot of the services that are provided in the community, right? Um, medical included. And and the modes of interpreting are consecutive. That's That's what you're your average person potentially knows, they may not know the name to it, but they, they may be familiar with it, which is where the speaker pauses and allows the opportunity for the interpreter to give their rendition. So that's called consecutive, right? There's, there's pauses okay. in between. There's short and there's long consecutive, because you've seen it. Like if you ever watched when the president is speaking to a foreign um, politician and there's somebody behind them taking notes, that's your interpreter. And then they go on forever. Those interpreters are amazing. They're like the best of the best because they're just note takes after note taking up like pages and pages. That's your long consecutive. That's not really something we necessarily encounter in community um, interpreting, but uh, that that's, that's what most people are familiar with. Then there's a simultaneous. This, these are the individuals that um, a lot of people think of maybe when the United Nations come together and they're all speaking and you see, uh, you know, some politicians with their headphones on, they're listening to an interpreter in real time. And so you, the interpreter is speaking at the same time, close to the same time that the speaker is speaking. They're giving their rendition. There is no pauses there. It's just go, okay. go, go, which is typically why you see more than one interpreter in one booth because they, they take turns. Oh, wow. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, they you have to take turns. You Yeah, otherwise it's like, 
<clears throat> you like me even if if you as an individual you speak for a long time your throat gets dry you've got to clear yes. your throat, your throat, your throat, your throat. <laughs> yeah <laughs> not to mention the brain what happens to the brain if you're if you're doing that for too long but um yeah there's mm -hmm. definitely fatigue involved with that with that mode for sure okay then at the hospital which one were you mostly using consecutive there was a lot of while there was a lot of information given, it was always given in a dialogue way in which they would allow for processing of the information by by the parents um, mm -hmm. and then for the opportunity to ask questions. And so because the setting was a, a, a setting of, of dialogue to be able to go back and forth between people, the consecutive mode is typically, um, that's generally just your rule of thumb will where we'll begin with that mode. We have the opportunity if you're trained to to mode switch, um, what they call if needed, but I never needed to do that in, in the hospital. There was never a, a moment where it was like a dump of information in which I needed to simultaneously interpret. I did do that after when I made a transition into K through 12 public education, but that's different. Okay. And then do you have to take a lot of notes as well when you were interpreting? Absolutely. Yes, that's a must. That's uh, a must. Consecutive, yeah, consecutive interpreting uh, and the notebook, it goes hand in hand. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that have excellent memory retention, but no matter how good you are, there's you've got to write things down. You know, think of number sequences, date of births, addresses, things like that, that um, you don't have to necessarily memorize, you could write it down so that your rendition or what you're hearing goes a little longer because you're not having, you're not so focused on, on retaining maybe a number sequence, you wrote it down, but you're listening to the rest of that message. And so there's techniques to that, you know, but note taking is definitely a must for interpreting, especially consecutive interpreting especially for long consecutive <laughs> interpreting, yeah. And what kind of things uh, were you writing down? Because I assume you are trying to write down every single like word that they're saying. I don't, well, if you're untrained, you do. <laughs> you oh, do. Okay. <laughs> you down, like, try to forget anything. Um, but no, you're, you're writing things down that are going to um, prompt your memory. And so, it's, I mean, it's, it's a whole technique, right? You're listening actively, very actively. You're listening to the message. Interpreters don't interpret words. We interpret meaning. We interpret messages. So it's the whole thing, right? And, and then we render the meaning into another language, into, in, a, in a way that's understandable um, to the other party. So not and not, I don't mean we change register or we you know we we keep it all the same but obviously you know languages differ right and in, in sequence and things like that um and so we listen and we we jot down or I jot down things that are going to prompt my memory so it could be hey this part was an exclamation point this part was a question right this this statement was a question um, there's technique in note taking, and and that's a whole separate course from just the interpreting aspect. So, uh, oh, okay. you're just, yeah, you're writing things down that are prompting memory, and it's not word for word. It could be words. It could be acronyms. You know, that it's basically the general rule is that um, the less pin strokes there are, the better, right? You're not you're wanting to write as less terminology as possible, and that's why. A lot of the times, all you see is gibberish on, a, on an interpreter's notebook. What, what seems like gibberish, it's not to the interpreter, but it could be symbols. You know, it's like hieroglyphics <laughs> <laughs> that, you end up, that you end up writing because it means something to the interpreter. Um, but all we're doing is, is writing things down to prompt our memory. Memory is really what we're relying on more than... Uh, note taking, which is why it's not shorthand. It's not the same thing as what a transcriber in the court setting does. Um, note taking for the interpreter is is very personalized, and and it's only to prompt memory, not to write everything down. 